right. Well, if you have a Bible, would you turn with me over to Revelation, but also turn back uh, kind of a hand in both places, 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter is actually not too far before Revelation, so uh, you might want to look at that. Um, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 is where we'll begin as far as our verses today. Now, if you're not familiar with where things are in the Bible, um, you can always follow along up here on the, on the screen. And also, one of those Bibles that you received, if you don't have one, now remember, we offer those Bibles to you free of charge, and they're nice Bibles. It's not like, oh yeah, it's one of those paperback Bibles where the print's so small it almost doesn't exist. Uh, no, this is giant print. These are giant print, and they're very readable. As a matter of fact, it's, it's pretty much the same Bible as I'm using. But... Um, uh, it'll be a blessing to you, and bring it, use it, get to know it, all right? Uh, listen, we're one bonus we have this year, and, and by the way, somebody remind me about this because I'll forget because I don't have it written down. Let's learn this week, if, you're not, if you don't know where all the books of the Bible are and you're coming to camp, when you leave camp this year, you're going to know where all the books of the Bible are. Wouldn't that be great? You might say, can I learn that in a week? That sounds like work. Nah. Two simple songs that we teach to children, and you will learn all the books of the Bible in order. That sound good to you? That's a bonus. No extra charge for that for camp this week. So I uh, hope uh, you'll come and you'll learn that as well as everything else. Over the years, I've talked to uh, lost people and also believers who struggle uh, with the issue of why it seems in their minds that God doesn't do anything, but He just sits there while there's all kinds of evil, corruption, killing, uh, uh, torture, and everything that goes on. I've had people sit in my office, believers, and actually there and actually get red in the face in anger towards God. Uh, And uh, why doesn't He do something? He should be doing something. If He's who He says He is, why isn't He doing something? I'm thinking to myself, whoa. Now, who's God? here? Who's God? Sounds to me like you're telling God what he has to do. Well, let me say this. That is something that we do wonder about as people, and that's a legitimate concern because we, we would like to see, we, we have built into us, God has wired us with a sense of justice. And, and, uh, and we know that. I even, when I talk to people who are atheists, you know, at the fair we talked to atheists this year, and, uh, you know, do you believe there's, uh, there's a... Uh, an absolute right and wrong. In other words, there's moral absolutes. No, I don't believe that. And then we get to the next one about, you know, have you ever done anything that you know is wrong? And they'll say, oh, yeah. It's like, okay, there's no right and wrong, but you know when you've done wrong. Isn't that interesting? According to who? Anyways, that's a whole other issue. We don't have time for that today. But why is it that God doesn't seem to step in and do something with all the wickedness, with all the injustice in our world today? Well, the answer to that is simple, and it's twofold. It's twofold. Number one, folks, God is the reason God hasn't stepped in yet and done something to this world and to the, the wickedness that we have is because He is long-suffering. He is long-suffering with the, the world to a certain point in order that he gives people more time to put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says this, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, people, well, when a person does something that wicked, why doesn't God just strike them dead? Well, I'll tell you why, friend. Because if he did, from that moment on, they would spend forever in conscious torment in hell. Now, God knows that. And guess what? He doesn't want them to go there. And so sometimes he will put off the judgment. He will put off the condemnation. He'll put off the the suffering of hell. So that that person has more time to hear the gospel. So that person can put his faith in Jesus Christ and the payment he made for their sin and be saved forever instead of ending up in hell, ending up in heaven for all eternity from that moment on. That's why he doesn't step in. That's number one. Number two is this. He will, in fact, do something 
about it all. And that something, according to Scripture, I believe, is coming very, very soon. My mom was one who would, who would ask that sometimes. Why doesn't God do something? These people who abuse children and stuff, why doesn't God do something? And I tell her, Mom, He's going to do something. He just doesn't do it according to our calendar. But He does do it, and He, and he will do it. Remember, long-suffering doesn't mean judgment will never come. It's that it just hasn't come yet. It hasn't come yet. See, folks, we are living today in the age or the dispensation of grace. Grace. The, the attribute of God that is being highlighted today or spotlighted, okay, uh, and, and the characteristic of God's dealing with man is it's according to this thing called grace. And grace is God's undeserved, unmerited kindness or favor, okay? God is dealing in grace with the world in which we live. God deals with his children in, in, in grace. God is a gracious God. Now, let me say this very clearly. Uh, it isn't that there's never been grace until today. And it isn't that there's no such thing as God's laws and moral principles today, okay? Grace has always been there, and God's moral principles and laws have always been there. But the highlight, the spotlight, if you will, today is on the grace of God. That's the emphasis, that's the focus of this period of time that we call the dispensation of grace in which we live. But that dispensation of grace is soon coming to an end. And we are going to enter into, in this world, a time of severe judgment from God. Judgment from God. Imagine it. You might say, oh, well, I've heard of that before. You, let me tell you something, folks. Revelation chapter 6 through Revelation 19 deal with this judgment of God that is coming. In other words, the vast majority of the book of, the, of Revelation talks about the coming tribulation period. This is coming. And I believe it's coming soon. Now, what we're going to be covering in chapters 6 through 19 is real. And these things are actually going to happen. And let me say it very clearly. They are horrific. They are horrific. They are going to be things that are unbelievably bad. And you might say, well, you're just, you're just one of those preachers trying to scare us. No, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to warn you, and I'll let God do the scaring. I'm just warning you of what he says is coming. That's my job. It's what I do, okay? Part of what I do. Also, these things have never happened before, so the only interpretation of them is a futuristic and prophetic interpretation. Now, those in the Reformed theology camp, they think that they're preterists. They believe that these things have already taken place uh, in, in the first century, all right? And the only way they could do, believe that is if they spiritualize it and they don't believe what it says, okay? That is not a good approach of Scripture if you don't believe what it says. The best thing to do is when... when uh, when the, the, the plain word of God, when it is written and it's in plain words, believe what it says, apply what it says, okay? Don't try to allegorize it or anything. Now, as we get into chapter 6, at the beginning of this series in Revelation, I mentioned that there is room for disagreement on some of the issues in the book of Revelation. We came over that when we talked about the overcomers in chapters 2 and three. All right. Uh, we come today again to, to one of those issues. As we go into chapter six through 19, I'm going to tell you what I believe, uh, how it fits together. All right. Not everybody agrees with me, but what I'm telling you is not, is, is not like an exclusive point of view. It is out there. It's just that it's not the, the one that was most popular in probably the last 50 years, but that's okay. We're going to be dealing with something called the seals, 
the, not er, er, seals, but seals like, remember the scroll? We talked about the scroll last week. We're going to be talking about the seals, the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and the, the vials or the bull judgments. Now, most of your dispensationalists will say, okay, well, the way it goes is this. There's the seal judgments, and then the last seal open, and that drops us down to the trumpet judgments, and then the last trumpet blows, and that drops us down to the bull judgments. In other words, 21 things right in that linear order, okay? I don't believe that. I've studied this several times through. As a matter of fact, I've spent a lot of time this time studying this, saying, now, was I wrong the last time, two times I taught Revelation? I'm open to that, and I'm glad to say, you know what, I, I see it differently than I used to. This is not a major point. We know these things are going to happen. The question is, when do they happen? How do they fit together? That's all we're talking about today. Now, I am convinced, again, for the third time, that the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the vials or bowls are overlapping judgments. Overlapping judgments. Within their group, they are consecutive, but I don't believe that each group follows the previous one exactly chronologically. In other words, so the, the, the seven seals that get open that we see here in, in chapter 6 and the beginning of, of chapter 8, there's the seven seals, all right? You might say, well, then comes the trumpets. I believe the trumpets are, with, are, are, are within the seven seals, okay? Some of those things you're going to find are almost identical. And then the bowls or vials, I believe those are very similar to the other things. Different in some ways, but very, very similar in the language, okay? So I think they're overlapping. That's, that's how I see it. Um, and again, there's, there's room for disagreement on this. It's not like a major doctrine of the faith. It's not like, you know, saying salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. That's the only gospel. Well, I don't agree with that. Oh, okay, well, we don't have to agree on that. No, we do have to agree on that. We do. It's just like, and I'm, I'm another one. I believe, I shared this with somebody this week, I believe that a pre-tribulational rapture, that is the only right interpretation of the future. Okay? Anything else than that takes away the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Okay? It has to be pre-trib. has to be pre-trib. And, and I, won't, I won't budge on that one. Okay? Now, some of them, as I mentioned, some of them, as we're going to look at those, those, those three sets, some of them even sound like they're exactly the same thing. And I happen to believe, in fact, that they are. All right? Also, when you read Matthew chapter 24, you see a clear parallel chronology in Matthew 24 with Revelation chapter 6. That's why I gave you that little chart today. And, of course, we've got that up here, and you can see it. And I'm not going to deal with it in detail, but maybe we can flash it up there and you can see that chart. Um, this is very important. Listen carefully. This is one of the major reasons I believe what I do about this. Matthew 24 is a linear description, okay, now, there's a couple things where it backs up a little bit, just a, a, about a certain point, and then gives you a little bit more information. But Matthew 24, and we've gone through Matthew before, and we've taught Matthew 24 and 25, and it's very easily, you can follow it, it's easy to follow, all right? Matthew 24, which takes you from the beginning of the tribulation all the way to the end of the tribulation, when Jesus comes back to set up his kingdom, Revelation chapter 6 is beautifully parallel with Matthew chapter 24. Okay? Now you might say, well, why are you making an issue of this? Because if Matthew 24 deals with the entire period of the tribulation and Revelation 6 is parallel with Matthew 24, then Matthew 24 or Revelation 6 deals with the all seven years. How many of you follow that so far? Okay? If you don't, would you just raise your hand anyway? No, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, you might say, well, well uh, why is this important? Well, I just want you to understand how it fits together. Regardless of how it fits together, these things are going to take place. 
And that is the main thing. That's the main thing. But as you see on, on your chart, uh, in Revelation 6, we're going to see the rider on a white horse, who's the Antichrist. Matthew 24, verses 4 and 5, talks about there's going to be false Christ or Antichrist, okay? Uh, Revelation 6 talks about war and bloodshed. Uh, Matthew 24, in, in verses 6 and 7, talks about wars and rumors of wars. And that goes all the way through. All the way down, by the way, to the last one there, in uh, Revelation 6, verses 12 through 17, talks about cosmic and geographical disasters worldwide. Guess what? Matthew 24, ver, uh, the sixth or the last part of it, verse 29, talks about cosmic and geographical disasters as well. Not only that, but can I mention this to you today? There are people who say this. Now, the majority view on, on, uh, from a pre-trib, pre-millennial perspective, which is what we are, the majority view on those things, a lot of the Bible teachers say this, well, the, 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 the seals, in other words, the first seven things, the seals, okay, that just deals with the first part of the tribulation, the, like the first half of the tribulation. A lot of them will say this, and it's relatively peaceful. That's what they'll say. It's relatively peaceful. And I say... I think, with all due respect, I think you're reading other people's writings on that and not the Bible. Because if that position is true and you read Revelation 6, if in Revelation 6 is only dealing with the first half of the tribulation, it's not peaceful. It's horrific. It's like a living nightmare that is real. No, friend, I don't believe that it's relatively peaceful. Okay, that's why I believe it goes, it goes through. Okay, enough. Revelation 6, verse 1, let's look at it. And I saw when the Lamb, Jesus, opened one of the seals, that's seal number one, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on, on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Notice he had a bow, but he has no arrows. And he's on a white horse. Now, we usually think the guys on the white horse are the good guys, right? That's how we usually think. However, we know that the Antichrist is going to come in peaceably, not forcefully. He's going to come in peaceably. I believe this is referring to the Antichrist. So number one, the rider on the white horse, all right? Uh, he is a counterfeit. He has a bow, but no arrows, and a crown was given unto him. He will be given power, and he is going to take over the world peaceably. You might say, how can this be? Well, Daniel chapter 11, verse 21 talks about him as well, and it says, in his estate shall stand up a vile person. That vile person is the Antichrist, to whom they shall not, uh, they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. That goes perfectly with Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. By the way, in Daniel 11, somebody will say, well, wait a minute, that's, that's, uh, that's talking about uh, 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 Antiochus Epiphanes. Yeah, I know that, it is. But in type, he is a type, he's a picture of the Antichrist, the future Antichrist, all right? And that's clear when you read Daniel. Now, you're in Revelation 6. I want you to hold your place here and keep your hand there. And then I want you to go to Matthew 24. Because <clears throat> we're going we're gonna to follow this through. Matthew chapter 24. <clears throat> so we see the rider on the white horse in Revelation 6, 1 and 2. Matthew 24, verse 5, it says this, For many shall come in my name. Now, by the way, the, the disciples asked him, When shall these things be? And he starts telling them what the future is going to be. Now, remember, the church age was not in view when Jesus was talking to them in Matthew 24. The church was still a mystery. So what he's talking to them, he's not talking to them about the church age. He's talking about, from their perspective as, as believing Jews, he's talking to them about the judgment that's going to come before the kingdom is set up. 
And that judgment that's going to come before the kingdom is set up is what we know to be the seven-year tribulation period today. And so that's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 24. And he says this in verse 5, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall what? deceive many. Do you know the most popular or the, 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 the most prevalent word in Matthew 24 is the word deceive or deceived? The last days and the tribulation period will be a period of incredible satanic deception. Incredible. Things will start out peacefully once the rapture issue is so-called explained. Now remember this, the rapture takes place, here we are, we're walking through life, and all of a sudden, we're out of here, the rapture takes place. Absent from the body, present with the Lord, in a moment, in the twinkling of, the eye, of an eye at the last trump. We're taken to heaven, so all true believers in Christ will be in heaven during that seven-year uh, tribulation period. That tribulation period will be going on on earth. That's what we're talking about here, all right? Now, when the church is taken out, the world is going to have to explain where all those people went, okay? Where'd they go? Where'd they go? You know, uh, people are going to say, well, I had a relative. Uh, they're gone. Or they were, we were in a car with them, and all of a sudden they disappeared. Where did, they, where did they go? Yes, there will be planes that go down. Yes, there will be cars and buses and so forth and trains that are going to go out of control, okay? Families are going to be losing loved ones. Some families will all go. Other families will be split, okay? How are you going to explain that? You ever thought about these things? Think about these things. How is it going to be explained? Well, I can tell you two popular ideas. Both of them are ridiculous. But I'll tell you what some of the things that, that, that will probably come up. All right? The first one is this. The idea that there will be a quantum leap in evolution. A quantum leap. Now, folks, if, if, if you're a Bible-believing Christian, if you've never heard this before, I hate to break the news to you, but the world views you and me as crackpots, okay? They think we're nuts. Now, we are nuts. It just so happens that we're screwed to the right bolt. But we are nuts. And you know what? Listen. Some of them, when they hear about the rapture, they actually say, well, good, that way that's a way for us to get rid of you. They'll say that. Aren't they kind? And it's like, sounds good to me. Absent from the body, present with the Lord, sounds good to me. It's like Paul, you know, I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ. Nothing wrong with that. I want to I be with the Lord, don't you, as a believer? So, the, but this is one of the things. They might say, could anybody really believe that? I got another question for you that's related. Can anybody really believe evolution? Okay, unprovable, ridiculous, makes no sense. And yet you talk to these people, and some of them will actually say, we know it doesn't make sense, but the only other alternative is special creation, and that is completely unacceptable. So what do they hold to? Evolution. So, you know, one of the theories in recent times to explain that there are no transitional forms from a monkey to a human and so forth. You know, if evolution was true, there should be all kinds of evidence of in-betweens, right? All kinds. Well, there aren't any. There aren't any. And they keep trying as hard as they can. And some of them just flat out lying and actually creating things to make you think that it's true. But in fact, they're proven to be actual, absolute, beyond a, question, a shadow of a doubt, lies about these things. Lies. Flat out lies. And so to try to explain why there's no transitional forms, they'll say, well, there was a quantum leap in evolution. So it wasn't slowly, slowly, so, slowly over billions and billions of years. It was like, you know, here's, here's like a, you know, hmm, kind of a creature. Here he is, and all of a sudden, bah! Nice, fully formed human, you know? Well, wait a minute. That should have taken at least four billion years. Well, it was a quantum leap. How's that for make-believe? 
You might say, well, no one really believes that. Oh, yes, they do. Well, that's ridiculous. Well, see, they, can't, they, well, they won't accept creation, therefore they have to come up with what I would consider a Looney Tunes kind of uh, explanation. So a quantum leap in, in evolution. In other words, those who have disappeared at the rapture were simply removed because they, Bible believers, were inferior to the rest of humanity. And so it's an issue of survival of the fittest, fittest so psh, they're just gone. They were not fit to continue on. They were hindering the progress of man as he climbs up the ladder to so-called divinity. I say, Pastor, you think they might believe that? It's possible. I'm not saying they will. I'm just saying it's a possible explanation of, of what they might say happened to the millions and millions of people who were missing from the planet. All over the world, by the way. Another idea, which is, believe it or not, this is very popular. Even Bill Nye, the science guy, holds to it. I feel very sorry for that man. I really do. Willful blindness he has. What's this thing that he's holding to now? We came from uh, Mars. We were planted here by aliens or something like that. I'm not sure the, the details of that, so don't quote me on that. But a lot of people say that's why we're here. We're basically, we're, we're sort of like seeds that aliens planted on Earth. And when we disappear at the rapture, they will basically be collecting us and taking us back. This is one of the explanations, okay? Now, I'm really not concerned about the explanation because I'll be in heaven at that point. So I will be gone, but it won't be to Mars. I've got something better in store. It's called heaven. Heaven. And by the way, chapter 4 and 5 described it pretty well at that point, and then we're going to see more about that at the end of the book. Hold your place in Matthew 24 now. Let's go to, back to Revelation 6 very quickly. It says in verse 3, and when he had opened the second seal, this is seal number 2, when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. Does that sound like a relatively peaceful time to you? My Bible says peace is going to be taken from the earth during that period. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. So here we see the red horse. Of course, red represents the color of blood. There's going to be incredible bloodshed during the tribulation period. Notice that peace is taken from the earth. What peace there is at the beginning of the tribulation through the promises of the Antichrist are going to quickly be, be taken away. There is going to be widespread war and bloodshed on this planet. Now remember you kept the hand in Matthew 24, right? Go back there and look at Re uh, Matthew 24, verse 6. Look at how this fits. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, remember this verse, there shall be famines and pestilences, diseases, incurable diseases, and earthquakes, in diverse places or various places. Go back to Revelation 6, verse 5. Keep your hand in Matthew 24. Revelation 6, verse 5, it says, And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And so we see the, the, the third one the, is the black horse, and this represents famine is going to come upon the earth. Okay. Now, by the way, famine always follows war. That's just a matter of history. We cannot even grasp that in America, can we? 
We're used to going into our super stores, right? Super Walmart, super Targets, super this and super that and super Coburns and, and all these different things. And you go there, you walk down the cereal aisle, and instead of there being cereal, there's a whole aisle of different flavored cereals, okay? All kinds of stuff there. Folks, that's prosperity. Guess what? There's going to be famine around the world. Famine. Now again, does that sound like peace to you? No. No. Grocery stores, all the variety we have, there's going to be famine and people, yes, and folks, yes, even in the United States. We got this imperialistic perspective on our country, like, well, you know what, that's all the other world, but we're, none of this is going to happen to us. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, yes, it is. I'll tell you more about what I think the future of our country is in later messages and how we fit into this whole last day scenario. Back to Matthew 24 and verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be what? Famines. Lines up perfectly with Revelation. There shall be famines and pestilences, diseases and earthquakes in diverse places. Okay? Back to Revelation chapter 6 verse 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of a fourth beast say, come and see. And I looked and behold a pale horse. You know where this is going, right? And his name that sat on him was death. And hell followed with him. See, if you die without Christ, that's where you end up. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth. The fourth part of the earth. That's a quarter of the earth. To kill with a sword and with hunger and with death and with beasts of the earth. Sounds like chaos to me. Doesn't sound like a time of peace. Sounds like chaos. So the fourth one mentioned is death. See, what, what does death do? Death takes physical life. Hell or Hades takes the spiritual life of those without Christ. It says a fourth part of the earth's population is killed during this period. Hey, do the math. That's approximately 1.5 billion people. A little more than that. 1.5 billion people. We do not know how exactly this will happen, okay? Uh, could uh, nuclear warfare be a part of that because of all the wars and all that? That's a possibility. We don't know for sure. We just don't know for sure. But certainly that would account for large amounts of people gone, right? You could accomplish that with nuclear warfare. This could easily account for such widespread killing and destructions, okay? Go back to Matthew 24, <laughs> Everything we've seen so far sounds like worse than the world has ever seen it. Are you ready for this? Matthew 24, 8? Look at it. Look at that. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. The beginning. I want to encourage you, folks, after today to go back and read these passages and let them sink in. Take your time and understand these are really going to come on our world. I don't believe, as some commentators do, that these things are symbolic of political things that are, hap that are going to happen. I believe these are actually going to happen. I really do. These are the beginning of sorrows. Back to Revelation 6, verse 9. It says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. In other words, you all were martyred, 
rest for now because the number of you is not full yet. There's still a whole lot more of you that are going to be martyred during this period of time. That's the believers who are going to come to know Christ during the tribulation period. So what is the fifth? The fifth is the martyrdom of the tribulation saints. Okay, back to Matthew 24, verse 9. And here it is. Jesus talking about it. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted. Look at the next words. And shall kill you. You, representing, talking to the disciples, representing believers at that period, during that period, the tribulation. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Folks, listen. You might say, you know what? The secular society and the press and all these people, they hate us today. They hate us. We don't know hate yet. Listen. Understand this. The restraining force and power on this world today to keep it from going 100% evil is the body of Christ. Okay? We are, the Holy Spirit through the church is restraining the world from going totally evil and wicked and perverse. When the church is taken out, the, the, the restrainer is going to be uh, 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 taken out. Now, that doesn't mean the Holy Spirit's not going to be working in the world. He is, but he won't be inside the church because the church will be up. The church will be in heaven. By the way, another proof of pre-tribulational rapture. When the church is taken up, it'll be like a dam breaking, a, a dam that was holding back 100% total wickedness and evil. And that is just going to flood the earth. And one of the places that's going to flood is the United States of America. Folks, listen, we're getting bad. What we're seeing are cracks in the dam. When the church is taken out, I'm giving you a preview of what I was going to preach on down the road. When the church is taken out, I personally believe we as a nation are going to implode. Not to say that everybody's a Christian in America. I know better than that. But I do know this. There are plenty of Bible believers in America. And when we are taken out, What's going to hold it back? Nothing's going to hold it back. Okay? Look at that. Verse 11, white robes were... Or, I'm sorry, we're in Matthew 24, aren't we? And ye shall be hated of, of, of all nations for my name's sake, and then shall many be offended or stumble, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. All right? Now... <clears throat> You might say, what is this betrayal stuff? Can I give you a little hint? You will not be able to buy and sell, buy or sell during the tribulation until you take the mark of the beast. If you're a believer during the tribulation, you won't be taking the mark of the beast. You may have family members who do take the mark of the beast. Now, I'm not, when I say you, I'm, you, if you're saved today, you're going to be out of here, okay? I'm talking about people who trust Christ the Savior during the tribulation period, all right? They won't take the mark of the beast. The unbelievers, so they can buy and sell, therefore provide for their family and eat, they will take the, take the mark of the beast. Taking the mark of the beast is a loyalty pledge to the Antichrist. And you know what? They will be glad to turn you in as somebody who is anti, antichrist, if I could use that term. It's coming. Some people wonder how people will trust Christ as Savior after the church is taken out. There will be many who are going to trust Christ right after the rapture takes place, for they will realize what they had, uh, what they had heard about Christ and the rapture was truth. I believe they're going to trust Christ as their Savior. There will also be those who trust Christ through the ministry of the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. More about them next time. I have heard people say that the 144,000 are saved today, 
and that they and, and that when the rapture takes place they will be left to evangelize no no that would be a violation of 1 Corinthians 15 it says we shall all be changed okay folks the rapture is the rapture it's not a rupture all right uh, can you imagine now now by the way when a Gentile trusts Christ as Savior today, they become part of the what? The church, right? When a Jew trusts Christ as Savior today, they become part of what? The church. What's going to be taken up at the rapture? The church. Are they part of the church? Yes. End of argument. Well, so then how's the word going to get out? Well, here it is. I believe this is the explanation. I think the 144,000 Jewish witnesses will have heard the gospel. But they did not accept Jesus as their Messiah. And when the rapture takes place, they too will understand it was the truth. They will put their faith in Jesus as their Messiah, as their Savior. And then God, as we're going to see next time, seals them. And they're going to go all over the world preaching the gospel. And the Bible says you can't even number the amount of people who are going to come to faith in Christ during that period. Those people who come to faith in Christ are going to be the tribulation martyrs. It's coming. It's coming. Some believe that if you've heard the gospel before the rapture and then you get left and you cannot be saved. And I know they base that on 2 Thessalonians 2. I don't believe 2 Thessalonians 2 is saying that. I don't have time to cover it today. We'll cover it probably in the future. But if you read the passage carefully, though, the Bible doesn't actually say what they're saying about that. that is a, that's a false conclusion based on assumption in the passage. Now, notice here these folks have white robes here in Revelation 6, okay? Remember chapter 3, verses 4 and 18? These folks were given their white robes because they were faithful to Christ and had died for Him, okay? That's what the white, white robes are about. I know people say, well, no, that's just salvation. No, it's more than that. Okay, back to Revelation 6, verse 12. It says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Did you just read that? Every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Does that sound peaceful to you? Now, some of the commentators say, well, what happens is the judgments get more severe as time goes on. More severe than every mountain and island were moved out of their places? I'd say that's pretty severe. No, why does this say this? Because I believe this is coming towards the end of the tribulation period. Again, I believe Revelation 6 is the whole tribulation period. It's just a general overview. Which brings us to Judgment 6, okay, or the sixth seal. Cosmic and geographical disasters. This is just one of the many descriptions of what is coming on this world. It's completely frightening, and it really should scare anyone who is on the earth when it happens. Jesus also spoke about this in Matthew 24, verse 29. And he said, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven. Sound familiar? And the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Sound familiar? Doesn't that sound exactly like what we read, or close to it, what we read in Revelation 6? Revelation 6, verse 15. And the kings of the earth, now watch this, and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand. They want to die 
because what they're experiencing is so horrific. But you know what, friend? When a lost person dies, regardless of what they've been experiencing in this world, it's nothing compared to what is on the other side if they die without Christ. Turn with me to John chapter 3. And let me explain this to you. you. You might be here today and you're not sure where you're going when you die. You might say, you know what, this kind of scares me. Well, as a fellow human, to you, it should. If I did not know Christ the Savior, this would scare me, and appropriately so. This is pretty bad. This is pretty bad. It's incredibly bad. Jesus said it'll be a period... Nothing that, may, that the earth has ever gone through will be like this. It'll be that bad. But can I tell you, folks, there's good news. Look at John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let me illustrate this. God has provided for you eternal life, and that eternal life is a free gift through what the Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross. What did he do on the cross? Well, let me explain why Jesus had to come. This hand represents you and me. And let this wallet represent sin. Now, I know it represents sin because it says so. Right? Sin. Okay. Here we are. God says we're all sinners. We know that, right? We all do things wrong. I do. You do. We all do. It's wrong. It's, it, when we sin, we are violating what God has said, okay? It's, it's a sin against God. It's a violation of His law. Sin separates us from God. To get to heaven, you have to be without sin. No sin whatsoever if you're going to get into heaven. It's all got to be gone. Yet we're sinners. But the Bible says God loves us in spite of our sin. He hates our sin, but He loves us, okay? He says our sin must be paid for, and it says the wages of sin is death, if we paid for our own sin, we would have to die physically and spend forever suffering eternal torment in a literal hell. God doesn't want that for anybody. Religion comes along and says, yikes, and they'll either say, well, hell that really doesn't exist, or they'll say, well, I know what I'll do. I'll do good deeds. That'll get rid of the sin. I'll go to church every week. Hmm, still there. I'll get baptized. Still there. I'll do good, good deeds. I'll give money. I'll be a good husband, a good wife, a good dad, a good mom. Yeah, yeah. Piling on those good works. The sin's still there. You have to have a payment for your sin. The sin's got to be gone. You have to be forgiven. Good works, the Bible says, will not take it away. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So what are we going to do? How are we going to get rid of it? Well, here you go. God understanding our predicament, there's nothing we could do to get rid of it on our own. He says, I love you so much, I would rather die than live without you forever. And he took on flesh, this hand representing God in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ, sinless. And when Jesus went to the cross of Calvary, he went for an express purpose of paying for our sins. And when he did, he died on the cross, he took our sins upon himself, and he made the complete payment, leaving us nothing left to pay for. He came back from the dead to prove it was done. And he says in his word that if you will believe in him, that means you put your trust in him as your Savior. Two promises, you will not perish. That means go to hell. But you'll have everlasting life, which is heaven. How long does it last? It's everlasting. What does that mean? Lasting ever. Never ends. Never stops. If you can lose your salvation, you don't have everlasting life. You have probation, not salvation. God gives everlasting life. Look at it again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever does what? Believes. Not believes and is baptized, believes and promises, believes and stops, believes and starts. No. Whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. A question to you today. Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you trusted in him and him alone to get you to heaven? Your good works won't do it. Remember, you've got to be perfect. You're already a sinner. The sin has to be gone, and the only thing that gets rid of the sin is putting your trust in Christ. And when you put your faith in him, your sin is taken away. He gives you forgiveness. You're forgiven of all your sin. 
But until you trust in Christ, you still have that on you. You're still condemned. He that believeth on him is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Would you trust Christ today if you haven't done that? The future for the Christian is great. The future for a lost person is absolutely frightening. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening, and would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, and God bless you.